Today on Straight Talk Africa, a man for the ages, Professor Ali Mazurui, died October 12, 2014. We remember his life and challenges, discuss and analyze his contributions and legacy. Dr. Mazrui was arguably one of the most influential African scholars and intellectuals of his generation. That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa. It's Wednesday, December 3rd. I am Shaka Sali. And I'm Mariama Diallo, your social media reporter. Hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. Thanks for joining us today. Before we begin today's program, we would also like to extend a warm welcome to our new affiliate, The Voice of Lango, an FM radio station based in the northern Ugandan district of Lira, with the intent to inform, educate, entertain, and upgrade her audience. You're most welcome to the family of Straight Talk Africa, and today we'll remember one of Africa's intellectual giants, Professor Ali Mazrui. Well, Dr. Mazrui had a huge impact on many Africans and people around the world. Coming up later in our STA inbox, we'll share some of your thoughts on his work and life through emails, Facebook comments, and tweets. Hope you'll stay with us. But first, Professor Ali Mazrui was one of the most respected African scholars ever. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more on the story. My name is Ali Mazrui, and uh, I was born in Mombasa, Kenya. Grew up there and then had my higher education in Great Britain and the United States. In fact, one of the benefits of the colonial experience is to awaken us to a shared identity across the continent. A frequent guest on Straight Talk Africa, the late Professor Mazuri defined an intellectual as a person who has the capacity to be fascinated by ideas and has acquired the skills to handle some of those ideas effectively. By his definition and ours, Ali Mazuri was one of Africa's greatest intellectuals. Not the fact that he wrote 30 books and over 800 articles and has all the bona fides of a world-class intellectual, you know. Um, it's the fact that he really made the continent of Africa look at itself in a new way. His was a lifetime of asking and raising issues and ideas that fascinate, inform, and provoke. But would Africa have been different uh, without colonization? Yes. Africans have to find out uh, themselves by studying themselves what would work best to produce accountable governments, and then if you ask uh, African people free, uh, that's a harder question than whether African states are free, uh, because African people sometimes suffer a lack of freedom as a result of their own governments rather than as a result of the global state of affairs. After the death of the Kenyan-born African scholar, October 12, 2014, Kenya's President Kenyatta said he was a towering academic whose intellectual contributions played a major role in shaping African scholarship. In the early 1970s, he was invited by Ugandan dictator Idi Amin to be his chief international affairs advisor. He refused the invitation and, critical of the powerful Amin, fled the country, often controversial. In the 1980s, he said, I want Africa to have the bomb, to frighten the system as a whole a reference to the U.S. and USSR's nuclear domination. His television series, The Africans, A Triple Heritage, praised Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi for inspiring Africans to take their place on the world stage, one denied by the colonial powers. He wrote of the American arrogance of power in world politics and of how a terrorist philosophy had ensnarled Islam. Missouri stood for the importance of critical thinking and free speech. He suggested a Pan-African Security Council, patterned after the United Nations Security Council, to respond to the continent's failed states and coups. 
Why, he asked, do post-colonial constitutions omit provisions for an impeachment process, writing, we might have to wait till the second half century of the post-colonial era before impeachment replaces the coup as a method of African regime change. Again, Bernadette Paolo. That despite all the controversies surrounding Ali Masuri, that he was such a gentle spirit and that he used his life to do good. And uh, I read a eulogy that said that he divided us. He really didn't divide us. He provoked us. He made us think. He stirred us up. And in doing so, he, he effectuated change, change in the way we look at things. Making it a better world. Making it a better Still world. And longtime friend and colleague, Professor Suleiman Yang, your last words? Uh -huh. He came, he performed, and he defended without being forgotten for his words. Always provocative, the thoughtful Ali Missouri was a preeminent scholar and teacher whose lessons for a troubled world and continent endure. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, now joining us here in our Washington studios are two distinguished guests. Bernadette Paolo, President and CEO of the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa, a premier entity that engages and educates Americans about Africa. Bernadette, I have to say, I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you one more time mm -hmm. on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you, Shaka. I'm the one that's honored, especially for this program today. Thank you so much. It's been a very, very, very long time, and I'm glad that uh, you could be here to pay a tribute to your friend, and indeed, our friend, really. Yes. You're most welcome. Thank you. Dr. Suleiman Nyang, Professor of African Studies and Comparative Politics at Howard University, based here in Washington, D.C. What about you, Professor? It's always a pleasure, of course, having you on the show, but how does it feel? How does it feel to be talking about Professor Ari Mazrui as the late Ari Mazrui, really? Thank you, Shaka. It's been a great pleasure to be in the company of Bernadette here and all your audience to remember Ari. It's a very important moment for all of us today. And last but not least, Professor Peter Anyangnyongo, who is a senator for Kenya's Kisumu County. He previously served as a senior Kenyan government minister and professor of politics at the University of Nairobi and at many, many other universities. As a matter of fact, uh, he also has the distinction of being the proud father of Ewan Lupita Nyongo the winner of an Oscar in playing, of course, 12 years, a slave. He joins us via telephone link up from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor Peter Anyangnyongo. Thank you very much, uh, Shaka. I'm happy to join you and Bernadette and Suleiman to remember our dear Professor Ali Mazrui. It's yes, always a professor, it's always a pleasure. He was, of course, uh, your professor at Makere, and of course later as a very, very close intellectual colleague of yours. Is that correct? Yes. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. Your country code is 1. Now, Peter, staying with you a bit, uh, he was your professor at Makere. You first met him back in 1968, uh, is that correct? Yes, I first met Ali in 1968 as a first year student of political science and philosophy and literature at Makerere. And how was he as a professor when you look back? Well, Ali was very engaging, very, very, very exciting student. He stimulated our minds and he had always this art of comparative thinking. Uh, he, he provokes students to think beyond the limits of their own cultural backgrounds. And I think his teaching of political theory and political philosophy was just very, very lively and, and not, 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 not easy to forget. 
You know, during the many years that uh, we interacted uh, uh, via Straight Talk Africa and other programs, he once told me about some of the most important debates that uh, he participated in during the time, of course, that you were a student at Makerere. Uh, he talked especially about uh, the one he had with uh, Jaramogi Ogingo Dinga, who was then uh, Vice President of Kenya, mm. who obviously was a very, very strong admirer of Ghanaian founding president Kwame Nkrumah. Mm. That when he criticized Kwame Nkrumah, Odinga immediately said, you know what, you are a traitor to Africa. You are a reactionary, Professor Mazirui. Yes, because you see, Ali wrote this essay, which was widely debated in the, in the Journal of the Transition and, and in African intellectual circles, which was called Nokuma the Leninist Tsar. <laughs> what Ali really meant was that although Nokuma was a revolutionary in terms of his politics, but in his style of leadership, he was more of a Tsar than a Lenin. And I think. At that point in time, we who were Pan-Africanists and who were great admirers of Nukuma really thought that Ali was trying to bring Nukuma down. And I think that's the issue that Jaramugi took up with him, because to call Nukuma a czar and a Lenin at the same time was, <laughs> <laughs> was kind of... But, but you know, it was linked to Mazrui's theory that African leaders tend to have some kind of royalist Tendency, you know, uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, royalist tendency in, in African leadership, uh, the carrying of the stick and the wearing of chiefly gowns and the search for a name that could link you to chieftainship or royalty, uh, and that is what led him to, to, to do that. And that's why I, w I was saying that when it comes to comparative thinking, Maduri was very fond of drawing these comparisons which, which stuck in your mind and made you think rather critically. Very interesting. Uh, what about you, Bernadette? How did you first meet <laughs> Professor Mazrui? And what really made him tick? What <laughs> made you feel like you really belonged on the same page, really? Yeah. Um, I met him when he was first on the board of directors of the National Summit on Africa and he stayed with us with the Africa Society. Mm -hmm. And at first, upon meeting him, I was starstruck. He's an academic, a celebrity, a media figure, and a legend. Um, but as he interacted with us more, I found that I admired so much his courage. And I thought that not only is he a master of the written word, but he's eloquent. Mm -hmm. And as a political scientist, he would look at the world and say what other people dare not say <laughs> in such a bold way. The courage. And I am not a diplomat. Uh, so I always felt that um, I shared that trait with him. But I was most struck of his lack of er by his lack of arrogance in the face of his many accomplishments. What about his humility? Humility. I mean, this is a man who met with the Queen of England, who addressed the House of Lords, who was named one of the top 100 world figures in terms of his intellect by Foreign Policy and Prospect magazine. And yet, we could sit across from one another and eat Chinese food or a sandwich in his very small office. He cared about what people thought. He cared more about what other people felt and believed than he cared about his, himself. What do you think uh, was perhaps his weakness? Um, I think his weakness was that he didn't give himself as much credit. I'm not talking about here being arrogant, but I think that he could have done a little better at promoting himself. <laughs> Do and you, in some instances, defending himself. Do you know that uh, he never, never owned a driver's license? Mm. No, I didn't know that. He could not drive a car, <laughs> an automobile. <laughs> that explains why we had to take him everywhere. <laughs> well, now we'll pause for a short break. and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website, Twitter. We are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. 
That's VOA Shaka. And join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOARIP Mazurui. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please don't go away. Let's take a quick look at the life of Professor Ali Mazrui. He was born on February 24, 1933, in Mombasa. His father was an eminent Muslim scholar and the chief Islamic judge of Kenya. He wanted to become a jurist in Islamic law. Mazrui's dream to follow his dad's footsteps was hindered by his poor results after secondary school in Mombasa. His speech in 1952 in celebration of Prophet Muhammad's birthday earned him a scholarship. Governor of Colonial Kenya Sir Philip Mitchell recommended him for a scholarship first at Huddersville College in the UK to finish his secondary education. Masrui left Kenya in 1955 for Huddersville College where he met his first wife, Molly Vickerman, and together they had three sons. Dr. Masrui graduated in 1960 from the University of Manchester in England and received a master's degree from Columbia University in New York a year later. He was already teaching at Uganda's Makerere University when he received a doctorate in political science from the University of Oxford in 1966. Sia Niyama Karoma, the First Lady of Sierra Leone, speaks to VOA on the Ebola crisis. I would want the people in West Africa to know that Ebola is real. Ebola kills. Early detection and prompt treatment can save lives. And I'm asking our people not to victimize or stigmatize survivors. Ebola is a challenge, but together we'll all be able to overcome it. That was Sia Niyama Karoma, the First Lady of Sierra Leone, speaking to VOA Africa on the Ebola crisis. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. Country Code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizuye. Let me come to you, uh, Suleiman. Uh, you, of course, uh, knew him very, very, very well. Uh, what do you most miss about him? Yeah, I miss Ali's sense of humor and his great concern for Africa and the African people. I yeah. think most of us who knew him are going to miss that power of Ali Masri. He, he once observed that uh, my life, he said, is one long debate. What exactly did he mean by that? Well, see, one thing that is striking about Ali Masrui is that his command of, I don't speak Swahili, but his command of English is so evident. And he used all the metaphors, analogies, and similes to make his case. And he is very much concerned about paradoxes and ironies in the human condition. So that was one of the reasons why, as our colleague Peter suggested, Nkrumah, as you said to him, being the Leninist czar, <laughs> you can see his sense of humor. Here is Kwame Nkrumah, who is a Republican, and he's behaving like a czar. <laughs> <laughs> you can see the irony and the contradiction. What about his other observations about, uh, still about people like, of course, uh, the Osage for himself, uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and, uh, of course, you add on people like uh, Mwarimu Julia Sinjerele of Tanzania, he used to refer to them as uh, philosopher kings. Was he fair to them? No, well, I think he was right in the sense that if you look at the history of African leadership since decolonization, we don't have the quality of leaders like that anymore. People who are highly educated, they were grounded in Western thought. That's why Ali will write a paper for President African. 
Greece in African political thought. How you have some Africans who are very much grounded in Greek thought and were able to use it to make a case. Kwame Nkrumah was influenced by Jefferson for the Americans, by Marx for the communists, and by Lenin. So you can see Ali Mosri was very much at home in Western thought. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about Ali Mosri being in a debate, he was very much caught up in the debate among Western intellectuals. Some of them are liberals, some of them are radicals. Some of them are conservative, some of them try to be liberal moderate. Ali was cutting between these groups. He used to be a man that was very inclusive, uh, a man who liked to share with people he interacted with. Uh, he called uh, some of his uh, uh, really academic assistants as intellectual pillars. Does that qualify him, qualify him uh, perhaps to be an intellectual treasure, as a matter of fact? Yeah, I think one thing that was very striking about Ali Mazri, and I think all of us who had the opportunity to share words, experiences, and memories with him, and these are the things you have with all human beings. You share words with them, you have memories with them, and you have experiences, all three. Those of us who knew Ali benefited immeasurably from his words, his experiences, and his memories. That's why when you were saying his students were pillars, that's why Ali will describe the intellectuals. I'm fascinated with anyone who is fascinated with ideas is an intellectual. So that's why he came with different kinds of intellectuals, political intellectuals, academic intellectuals, literary intellectuals. And of course, you have all kinds of intellects for him. For him. So those are his pillars. Now, Senator Nyong'o, Professor Ali, once, yes, uh, Professor Ali once confided in me that uh, he, had a very so he had a very, very soft touch for you and a one Okero Ochuri at Makerere. Yes, yes. Was that true? And if true, why did he have a soft touch for you guys, soft spot for you guys? <coughs> well, Okero was both his student and his tutorial fellow because when I went to Makerere in '68. Okello had just come from Sussex as, uh, with a master's degree, and he was our tutorial fellow. And he was very close to Matsui in terms of discussion, in terms of uh, looking after some of Matsui's students as a tutorial fellow. And, you know, Okello shares uh, some of Matsui's traits. Okello uses the English language very creatively. Oh, yes. And Okello also liked comparative politics a lot, I think. As a student myself, I was interested in both uh, politics and philosophy. And Ali actually had persuaded me to go to Oxford and go and do my PhD in Oxford to follow his footsteps at Nuffield College. But unfortunately, that was not to be, and I went to the University of Chicago instead. But also, I think he more or less took me as one of his, his, his senior sons, as it were, because whenever he was away, he'd ask me to in his, uh, at least go home, and uh, there was a Rwandan girl who was also looking after the kids as a student and was learning French under his wife. So the two of us kind of got on very well at Nali's days. It's very interesting that um, he did not succeed uh, in having you follow his footsteps or his nyayo, as they say, to local <laughs> in Kenya, uh, for you to go to Oxford. In fact, he also had wanted uh, Okero Ochuri to do the same. The only person who seems to have done it was, of course, uh, another man who is now late. Uh, that was Dunstan yeah, Wai. Dunstan Wai. Uh, Dunstan Wai. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Well, well, mine was mine was kind of an accident to not going to Oxford because see, when when I was doing my final exams, Professor John Joseph Okumu was the our external examiner and the chairman of the Department of Political Science University of Nairobi. And after his matter of papers, he called me one morning in his hotel room. I said, look, I think you're going to do very well. I'm giving you an offer at the University of Nairobi as a special lecturer, complete with a scholarship to go for postgraduate work. So you have to decide. I mean, that offer was too attractive, so I had to come back home. And the postgraduate course I was supposed to do was either going to be at Chicago or Harvard, uh, support the Rockefeller Foundation. So I kind of conveniently forgot Oxford in that process. <laughs> very interesting, very interesting. Now, talking about the University of Nairobi, any particular reason why one of Kenya's most eminent scholars never had an opportunity 
to teach at the University of Nairobi, let alone in a university in Kenya for that matter? Well, you know, we went through a period of what I call uh, intellectual intolerance. I mean, <laughs> Ali could easily have come back to Nairobi uh, after Makerere if somebody like Tom Boyer had been around because, you know, during Tom Boyer's time, there was a lot of intellectual uh, opening, a kind of a free society, I would say, in Kenya. Because I remember Tom Boyer was a kind of person who easily debated with intellectuals. And uh, Secretary General of Kanu and the ideologue for the party I think he tolerated an open society. Of course, after his assassination, the authoritarian regime took a very hard stand against intellectual freedom and academic freedom, and I don't think that they would have welcomed early back home at that point in time. And it continued for a long time. We had to struggle against it and, of course, suffered for it. And I think Ali conveniently kept away from trying to meddle in this kind of intolerant environment and uh, <coughs> became much more productive elsewhere. It's very interesting for you to say that because I remember him telling me that uh, despite, of course, uh, being a legitimate Kenyan citizen, uh, he was actually first introduced uh, to Kenya's founding president, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, by Ugandan president, Dr. Apollo Milton Obote. That is true, really, because um, I remember when Kenyatta came to Makere, I was trading with a student guild there. He, he came for the inauguration of Makere University, and he was in the company of Nyerere and Kaunda. So the four of them uh, attended the inauguration of the university. And I think that is when Ali really met Kenyatta much more for, for a longer time in the presence of Milton Obote. What about the debate that uh, you arranged between uh, uh, Professor Ali Mazuri and, of course, uh, Walter Radney, uh, the author of the classic <laughs> How yeah. Europe Underdeveloped yeah. Africa, <laughs> and a man who was considered to be the dean of the intellectual leftists on the continent? Yeah, well, well <laughs> it was interesting because uh, Milton Obote is, uh, declared at that point in time that Uganda was going to the left. And, uh, yeah, the UPC government had, has, had published this uh, common man's charter and uh, required students to go to the countryside and explain the common man's charter to the people. <laughs> and then we said that, look, uh, that the level of literacy in the countryside is rather low. How are people going to read the common man's charter? So we decided to organize this debate, which was entitled The Written Word and Mass Mobilization in Africa. And we invited... Walter Rodney from Dar es Salaam and Ali Mazrui, of course, from Makere, and Professor JPBM Ouma, who was Professor of Geography and who knew a lot about demography at the same time. So the three of them, I was in this panel and I was chairing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an extremely interesting panel because Ali and, and, and Walter really took on each other in an ex extremely exciting way. Mm -hmm. And it was televised on Uganda television and live. Uh, and I think that debate kept on being talked about for quite a long time in Uganda and East Africa, and even up to now. So who do you actually think uh, won that debate? <laughs> I think na na neither Ali nor, 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 nor Walter won, really. Because I think, let me give you, for example, when Ali was talking, Ali said that, look, uh, we must... Uh, uh, at least credit the colonial regime for having brought the written word to Africa uh, because although the written word was used to oppress Africans during colonial times, it also gave us education which we finally use as a weapon to get rid of uh, colonialism. So on the, although on the one hand colonialism was oppressive, on the other hand it was liberate, liberate, liberating because it gave us a weapon for liberation. When uh, Walter came to speak, Walter <laughs> said, well, Professor Ali Mazrui has told you that on the one hand, colonialism was good, on the other hand, colonial, colonialism was, was bad. Uh, colonialism had only one hand, the hand of oppression, <laughs> the hand of exploitation. <laughs> and everybody so, out laughing. <laughs> when, when Ali came to reply, Ali said, well, you know, Professor, Professor Rodin and I are not really in conflict over this issue. I think Professor Rodney is being much more faithful to historical materialism, whereas uh, on my part, I'm much more filial to historical facts. 
And then Walter came back and said, Professor Mazrui and I are not in conflict. Uh, we are not <laughs> even in contact. We are not in contact. That was we are not course, even in contact. Uh, the kid, of course. Well, those phrases kept on lingering in my career for quite a long time, and, and I remember them fondly. I want to remind me, reminded <laughs> earlier that it was very exciting. Walter Rodin, of course, taught at uh, University College Dar es Salaam, uh, but of course he was yes. uh, from uh, Guyana. Guyana. Yes. Well, you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. <laughs> we'll have more of a discussion in a moment, but first here is Mariama Jaro. Take it away, Mariama. Well, thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the outstanding feedback we've received from you through social media. And a reminder that you can participate in this conversation by posting on our Facebook page or sending us a tweet or email. You can also call us. We'll be glad to share some of your comment in this program. Meanwhile, here is our letter of the week. Patricia Namdi from Kampala, Uganda writes, by and large, Professor Ali Mazrui was one of the most influential intellectual giants of his generation. He was a great academic and acted as a role model to many students he taught in the different universities around the world. His views encouraged many people to develop interest in political affairs and nationalistic movements. The many books and articles he wrote have changed the life of many people in fields like politics, culture, and religion, especially Islam. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number 202-619-3111. And the U.S. country code is 1. Call direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to keep your questions brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizui, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Mariama. Take it away again, Mariama. Well, Shaka Africa has given birth to numerous authors whose writings over the years have had lasting effects on, re on readers. Many analysts considered a Kenyan-born Professor Ali Mazrui one of those people often referring to him as an intellectual giant. He'll certainly be remembered for the numerous writings that had uh, a huge impact on Africans in general and people around the world. His famous television documentary, The Africans' a Triple Heritage, which addressed Western Islamic and indigenous influences on the African continent, also had an impact on many. Dr. Mazrui gave all Africans who aspire to intellectual greatness the example that intellectuals must be independent-minded, innovative, and unpredictable. This leads us to our question of the week, asking, to what extent do you think, do you agree with those who suggest that Professor Ali Mazrui was perhaps the most influential intellectual giant of his generation? Well, let's begin with a comment from Abdi Mualim from Hargeisa, who writes, Ali Mazrui was one of the most influential scholars in Africa. He once described my own country, Somaliland, as Africa's best kept secret. So today, Africa lost one of her best giant boys. <laughs> He'll live in our hearts. Well, another comment comes from Mohammed Ahmed Mansour from Monrovia in Liberia who says, Professor Mazrui was the most influential intellectual giant of his generation because he entertained a number of intriguing ideas, such as his pet concept of Afro-Arabia, the merging of Africa and the Arab world. He was also willing to confront contentious issues. He would be remembered as a hero. Wow. Shaka, very, very touching comments from people who seem to have 
been greatly affected by Dr. Mazrui's work and also respect him for his willingness to address some of the hard issues. Thank you. Anything uh, to add here, Bernadette? Yes, I just wanted to talk about Professor Mazrui's attitude toward women. He was not only a humanitarian, he was very egalitarian in his views as they pertain to women. And he believed in the equality of women. And he talked often about women in indigenous cultures in Africa not staying in the home, but being very much at the forefront of making determinations with respect to business and marketing. And I, I think that that is to his credit. And he talked about also Islam, and Suleiman mm -hmm. is much better positioned to talk about that. But a woman's role within Islam, I think that another thing I would like to say, you know, you could never predict Ali Mazuri. Unpredictable. He was a devout Muslim, yet both of his wives mm -hmm. were non-Muslim. That is correct. And he believed, and he once said to me, that love transcends religion. And I think that um, those are things, he was always changing, he said, and adapting his mm -hmm. philosophies and mm -hmm. theories. He wasn't mm -hmm. stuck. But, it, but those were two things that he really believed about, you know, being uh, also, always tolerant. But isn't it true, though, that uh, his second wife, Pauline Itu, converted to Islam? Um, I don't think that's true. Really? Mm -hmm. And not to my knowledge. We'll see well, her later, but I don't Maria, know. Maria, what do you see is our audience saying? Well, uh, just a reminder that we are tweeting live today. Uh, use the hashtag VOA RIP uh, Mazrui, or rest in peace uh, Mazrui. And if you haven't yet, uh, please follow us at uh, VOA Shaka. And speaking of it, uh, let's go to a tweet uh, from Daniel Osiemo, who writes, uh, he, uh, Dr. Mazrui, was influential, but giving him a superlative is a little overboard. Well, Shaka Danielle doesn't seem to agree with uh, what he sees as an exaggerated uh, expression of praise for Dr. Mazrui. Very interesting. Uh, what about that, uh, uh, Suleiman? Yeah, I think Ali himself told you that he was prone to debates. Ali Mazrui was an engaged intellectual. And unfortunately, we don't have many engaged intellectuals because in many of the African countries, it's suicidal to be an intellectual, intellectual at home. I was not surprised by the treatment he got from the political elites in Kenya mm -hmm. and in, on the Idi Amin. That's one point. What this young man is saying, he is on the other side of exaggeration in the minimization of Mazrui. Mm -hmm. Because Mazrui is minimized by two kinds of people. Reference was made by Peter with regard to the great debate with our late colleague from Guyana, Walter Rodney. Uh, that is a well-known debate. Ali Masri engaged Wole Soyinka. He's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And, of course, because he's a defender of Henry Gates at Harvard, you have that tension. But there are supporters of Ali Masri who are South Sudanese, like Dunstan Y. Dunstan and myself and another colleague from Nigeria were supposed to publish an edited volume on Ali Masri. Dunstan fought very hard for the South Sudanese before they became independent. But Masri was his strongest supporter. And he made a big argument with the Sudanese when he talked about Sudan and the problems they have. They have a triple problem in Sudan. So Ali was very tolerant. I agree with Bernadette's argument about Ali. Ali is a Muslim. He's not a fanatical Muslim. Unfortunately, why Wale Soinka went the other way? That's why the young man who is saying that, he's going towards Wale Soinka's position. Mm -hmm. He tried to minimize Ali's contribution. When Ali deserves a higher A-plus rating, when you want to minimize his status, because you try to catch him in that polarization. His wives were Christians. Okay. Mm. And he was not being on Islamic. Muhammad married a Jew and a Christian himself. So <laughs> Ali was very faithful. He was a very free man. But what about uh, some rightly or wrongly who criticized him for having come from a background uh, in their view that uh, basically participated in enslaving 
indigenous Africans. Now, okay. Now, let I think. You know, I think this, I'm very happy, Saka. You gave us this moment, Bernadette and myself, to be here for history. Because all these young people who are around the world who are listening to this program, they're young Africans in colleges and universities in high school. This is a moment for them. Ali Mazrui was very much related to. The, he came from a royal family. They were. Listen, they were burying him on Fort, Fort Jesus. Correct. That's the name of the place where he was buried. Chief Kadi. Just first. It was, the Portuguese gave that name when they came down there. <laughs> you see, this whole story, Ali well, Mazuri's story is long. Unfortunately, the time happens not to be our best. Allah, I will come back to you later. Mariama, <laughs> any more feedback? Well, uh, indeed, uh, we can move on to a posting uh, from Andrew Odor from uh, Kwania Camp County in Uganda, who writes, Professor Mazrui was an accomplished scholar who has made an indelible mark on the lives of many. Can we start up a foundation named after him where Africans will contribute funds that would later be used to build a university in his name? And while we're at it, let's look at another one. Uh, this time, uh, Jonathan uh, Lutangu from Lusaka, Zambia, who says, I enjoyed his documentaries and insightful analysis. He made me understand slavery from an African perspective. Rest in peace, Professor Mazrui. Oh, wonderful. Well, Shaka, once again, uh, quite touching uh, comments, especially the one uh, about uh, building a university uh, under his name. Well, looking at uh, the reaction from the African continent, I think, uh, reminds me of one thing really about Mazrui and a few others that I have had uh, the privilege, uh, uh, frankly, to meet and interact. Mazrui was not simply a Kenyan citizen. He did not mm. only belong to Kenyans. Mm. He belonged to Africa, belonged to the world, belonged to all of us. In fact, I see no reaction through Facebook and what have you from Kenya. Well, thanks, Mariama, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, uh, that does it for today's uh, social media segment. Uh, thanks to Professor Nyang, Bernadette, and Peter, uh, of course, for weighing, in in, uh, our, for weighing in our audience's thoughts. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, just drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Just enter the keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com. Or you can join our YouTube channel. Simply subscribe to VOA TV to Africa. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on this program, a discussion on the continent's fight against terrorist groups Boko Haram and Al-Shabaab. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. A reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. To participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. The U.S. country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. Professor Mazrui's many books began with the publication of three in 1967. He fled Uganda in 1973 and went to the University of Michigan to teach political science. In 1986, he produced a major nine-hour TV series, The Africans, A Triple Heritage, which provoked a debate in Africa and globally. Dr. Mazrui married his second wife in 1991, Pauline Uti, a Nigerian teacher, and together they had two sons and a daughter. In 2007, he was awarded the national title of commander of the Order of the Burning Spear, first class, by Kenyan President Mwe Kibaki. He was president of the Association of Muslim Social Scientists of North America and president of the African Studies Association of the United States.
He served as the Albert Schweitzer Professor in the Humanities and Director of the Institute of Global Cultural Studies at Binghamton University, State University of New York, until his retirement on September 1st, 2014. He had also held an at-large professorial appointment with Cornell University and the University of Jos in Nigeria and lectured at many schools around the world. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue, Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com. Or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gibuyu, and welcome back. Uh, today we we'll remember Professor Ali Mazurui, one of Africa's intellectual giants. Our distinguished guest, uh, Bernadette Paolo, President and CEO of the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa a premier entity that engages and educates Americans about Africa. Dr. Suleiman Nyang, a professor of African Studies and Comparative Politics at Howard University, based here in Washington, D.C. And last but not least, Professor Peter Anyangenyongo, the senator for, Kisumu's, for Kisumu County, rather, and he previously served as a senior Kenyan government minister and professor of politics, University of Nairobi and many other institutions. He joins us via telephone link up from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Well, I have to say, Bernadette, uh, Suleiman, and Peter, of course, uh, I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have had the opportunity to host the three of you in this special edition, really, of Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you, Saka. You're most welcome, uh, Ndugu Peter. Now, let me come to you, Peter. Uh, you obviously, you knew the professor very well right from the time when uh, uh, you were pretty much a teenager, really. Uh, what do you think that uh, perhaps he will be best remembered for, really? Some people have talked about uh, the Africans, a triple heritage. Uh, others have talked about uh, his BBC race lectures, uh, the Human Condition, remember the book, uh, as a result of those lectures. Well, what do you think you will perhaps be best remembered for? Well, I think the most obvious thing to remember him for are his books, of course. That's very obvious. But I think the much more important thing to remember is the impact of his uh, writing and his speeches on, uh, on the development of social science in Africa. I mean... Um, and in the world, for that matter, I think at uh, the time that Ali Mazrui had uh, perhaps some of his most controversial debates was when social sciences thought that that direct research or or, or, or research as such, um, primary research, collecting data, analyzing data, and, and then publishing is perhaps the most scientific thing to do in the social sciences. But Ali, being a political philosopher, really thought that thinking about issues and ideas at an intellectual level and using existing knowledge to question what you are observing and what other people are seeing and talking about is a very important aspect of developing knowledge. Ali kind of reminded me of St. Paul in the Acts of the Apostles, <laughs> Paul's letters, really. I mean, Paul was a very early theologian. He didn't do any research about religion or this or that society. But his observation about religion 
And the boat is turning in particular is very important. Remember when he went to one of the cities, I think, when he found a statue where, which was dedicated to the un, unknown God. And then he said, this God, which, whom you worship as unknown, this is the God that we worship as the God of Jesus Christ. So he was saying, look, this, the, the, we may not have something... Uh, conflict here. U.S. is unknown, as unknown, but it's not God all the same. Mm-hmm. That's a very profound theological observation. And Ali was like that. He was very much like St. Paul. <laughs> very interesting. Very interesting. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Let's go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. I gather there is a one Mujenoa from Tanzania. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Tanzania, can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, hello, hello, Shaka. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm calling, I'm calling from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Yes, please. What is your question or comment? Um, uh, actually, I want, I want to comment about the Professor Mazrui. You have one minute, please. Yes, Professor Mazrui can be remembered uh, on the revelation of Africa. Professor Mazuroi can be remembered on the revolution of Africa, especially the, the movement for revolution of, from colonialism, because he wrote several literatures concerning the revolution of African, uh, African countries from colonialism. Therefore, can we remember that he was the liberator of this continent, Africa. I and see. also, uh, Professor Mazuri also can be remembered for his contribution in the African literature. Because in the African literature, well, I'm afraid. And, uh, uh-huh. Especially on the contribution on education, education, the role of education in liberation, you can remember Professor Mazuri that, that he was the, a good educator. By showing the African that true liberation can come only uh, after getting good education. And also we can remember Professor Mazrui on his role on women, women emancipation by then. Now we call it gender because he wrote several research concerning the liberation of women in development. I see, I see. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I gather that we do have uh, a tweet from uh, Ignatius Oceana, and it reads, uh, when an intellectual like Ali leaves the world, it's like a library has burnt. Mm. R.I.P. Mazrui. Any comment on that, uh, Bernadette? I think it's a profound comment, and I, I think that that's how we feel right now. That's how but, we feel. But... Uh, I think this program and the program we're going to do at the Library of Congress and his legacy and his work, Mm -hmm. there are many, many more libraries to be built that will house his work and the new works of authors and poets and other scholars from Africa. And we're Mm -hmm. doing, we have a series that he started at the Library of Congress so that there could be a spotlight on their work. So I think we feel like that now, but we have to look to the future. He would want us to. You remember one great American uh, soldier during the Second World War, General Douglas MacArthur, yes. once said that uh, <laughs> soldiers never die, they fade away. So how do you relate that metaphor to Mazurui in this particular context, uh, Professor Young? Yeah, I think Mazurui is a library that came and went, but his ideas are going to survive. It's very interesting that Peter used an analogy with Paul. Paul. Mm-hmm. Most scholars of religion see Christianity as Pauline Christianity because Paul was not a disciple, but he had greater influence except for Peter than all the rest. <laughs> you see, so Mazrui is going to be remembered by many of the Africans of the younger generation. The intellectuals will see him coming. And Peter, Peter may in fact have a point because uh, I have... I have uh, read variously that uh, Mazurui in Africa, when he was still at Makerere, was frankly 
at least according to them, regarded as, um, you know, very conservative intellectually. But when he came to the United States, he seems to have been liberated and suddenly become like a liberal. Now, you see, now it's very interesting. No, I'm very happy that you say this. And Bernadette is a witness. And all the people who are listening to you today are all witnesses. When I wrote about Ali myself 34 years ago, I didn't know him. But the conservative side of Ali you described was there in Ali. Ali Masrui, together with some other intellectuals I have written about, people like Said Hussein Nasser, who is an Iranian, both of them were conservative at the home front. Mm -hmm. America's racism, America's attitude towards non-whites, third world people, had a lot of things to do with Ali Masrui and with people like Said Hussein Nasser and some of the other people like Ismail Faruqi and others who are in the Islamic narrative. Some of us have investigated. You are quite correct. Ali was conservative. He was very cautious in terms of how he negotiated. But he was committed to the conservative liberalism from where he came from, Oxford, Cambridge, or London. Oxford D. Field. You would see that unmistakably even also at his office wall <laughs> in Binghamton. Oxford D. Field. D. Field Oxon, rather. Uh, Peter, w w what about uh, a name by Lynn Cheney, what does it remind you of, especially regarding, frankly, to the Africans, the triple heritage? You recall, of course, that uh, she thought it was incredibly biased. She said, worse than unbalanced. I don't get that, Shaka. What, what are you saying? Uh, asking again? Lynn Cheney. Lynn Cheney, the wife of uh, Dick Cheney, who was vice oh, yes, president. yes, yes, okay, Lynn Cheney, yes, yeah. She was the chairperson of the National Endowment mm. for the mm. Humanities. That's right. Which yes. had uh, contributed $600,000 toward the making of the series, the African, yes. a triple heritage. Yes. She said yeah. she actually found that series worse than unbalanced. Your reaction? Well, I think some people were, were kind of, uh, in the States in particular, were kind of offended when Ali faces on uh, Gaddafi. Uh, that's one. And second, when Ali oh, said that the Af Africans should be given the bomb, mm -hmm. at least to create what he called a balance of terror in the world. Mm. Um, <laughs> I mean, some of these bold statements kind of rubbed people in the wrong way. Uh, Lynn Cheney must have been one of those people who was rubbed in the wrong way. But I think she overreacted, really, because if you live in a liberal society, in an open society, you should be able to entertain all kinds of thoughts. Let a thousand thoughts uh, contend, uh, you see. Uh, and, and one of those thoughts that Ali was throwing into the, into the arena was that, look, let's not think of the world simply of these two superpowers. In the event that Africa has a bomb, maybe we should solve the conflict or the competition between the USSR and, and the USA. And I think that should have been debated on its own merits rather than killing uh, the idea of an issue. Very interesting. Uh, so, yeah. Very interesting. In fact, uh, she said uh, when it came to the series, the British like to listen, but Americans like to talk, not to listen. <laughs> well, <laughs> on that I note, <laughs> on that note, uh, thanks to our distinguished guests. <laughs> and they are Bernadette Paolo, President and CEO of the Africa Society of the National Summit on Africa. Dr. Suleiman Nyang, Professor of African Studies and Comparative Politics at Howard University. And last but not least, Professor Peter Anyang Nyongo, the Senator for Kisumu's Kisumu County, who joined us via telephone link up from the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Butte. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, please. And remember to keep the African hopes alive. I'm Larry London from Border Crossings, and this is VOA. Follow us online 
at voanews.com.